we worked up with like um, the cutest technique, the quick thoracic ultrasound technique, as we gave the child the name. Uh, the main characteristics of it is that it goes really fast with only one movement and small calves for each side, one left, one right. And you just start caudally and you push it forward underneath the elbow and then uh, you can visualize the cranial lung lobes. Um, it has landmarks identification points and the nice thing with this is that we also tested it in novice operators huh? because that's a challenge yes welcome to the dairy health black belt podcast by wisenetics i'm luciano cacheta faculty at the university of minnesota and your host for the our conversation today and today we have the pleasure to have Dr. Bart Pardon from Grant, Grant University, who's going to talk to us about a topic that's very, uh, very on vogue and something that we're doing very often, which is about thoracic ultrasound. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Dr. Pardon. Hi, it's great to be here. Yeah, good, good to have you here and good to have an expert uh, on thoracic ultrasound. And we have heard of thoracic ultrasound for a couple of years now. Uh, but you and your group have a paper not published not long ago uh, talking about this. It's it's a quick, it's a quadrant uh, thoracic ultrasound. So how how did you develop and how does that differ from the what we have we're used to see for the last decade or so? Well, yeah, well, for the last decade. Um, thoracic ultrasonography, the classic one is the one that you do just from dorsal to ventral and you go through each rib, which is very time consuming. It may be reliable, it's very time consuming. So uh, different groups around the world, they developed their own ways of scanning, their own POCUS and point of care ultrasound applications. Um, and the main objective for that is actually to make it more faster, reliable, and etc. And for us, it was the, the same story. And what, what, what basically uh, we worked up is like, like um, the cutest technique, the quick thoracic ultrasound technique, as we gave the child the name. Uh, the main characteristics of it is that it goes really fast with only one movement and small calves for each side, one left, one right. And you just start caudally and you push it forward underneath the elbow and then uh, you can visualize the cranial lung lobes. Um, it has landmarks identification points and the nice thing with this is that we also tested it in novice operators huh? because that's a challenge yes yeah. researchers use it and and uh, you can train your own staff and stuff like that but what about people in the field huh? how good are they and with that technique uh, we discovered that yes there's it requires training regardless of the technique used it requires dedication training some hours to do that um, and at least with this technique we could actually have estimates and with the training that practitioners can really get reasonable, good to very good results. But it's variable between them. No, but, and that's good. The point that you made about the being quick and the fast, the fast examination is, is very important, right? Like, because as you mentioned, like when doing research, we have all the time in the world to like do the trial. Like you do, that's what you're doing. And like practitioners, you have to be, you are on the clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You may be right, but I can only confirm that also as researchers, we are also under time pressure. And if you do trials in 400 calves, 300 calves, 400 calves, you also want, uh, want it to go faster and reliable. So you want to spend one, two minutes a calf and have a reliable diagnostics. But what that paper is about, what I'm very enthusiastic about, is that you that's just a scanning method. But you use the scanning method um, to identify animals that require antimicrobials, animals that are ill. And in research, we've been using this by cutoffs, like a lung consolidation depth, more than one centimeter, more than three centimeter. All the studies even report um, any consolidation of any depth that animals should be should be already treated with it. Um, and then there are also some clinical scoring systems have been developed with different categories, different lobes, etc. And we asked ourselves the question like, hey, if we want to make a scoring system, it needs to be as simple as possible and every category that we have must have a meaning. What I want to say with that is that having a meaning means that every different category in the scoring system should be linked with, for example, a difference in production outcome. But you mean the meaning, you mean like there's a biological relevance to each category? Well, for each category, there's an economical relevance. Okay. Growth retardation, lower milk production, uh, carcass, lower carcass, etc., like that. So there's an economical difference between each category. Okay. And more important and linked with that, there's a difference in cure. Okay. 
For us, that was really important because we hypothesized that animals which have uh, deeper consolidations, more consolidations, maybe consolidations localized in some parts of the lung, that they have poorer cure. And so to make a scoring system as simple as possible, we made this trial in more than 1,000 male dairy calves. We scanned all those, all those calves and we, they were exposed to a metaphylactic treatment with doxycycline, oral, which is like standard in our view facilities. And then we scanned them short term, immediately after the cure, but also at the long term evaluation point, which is like 10, weeks of, uh, 10 to 12 weeks of age, so around weaning, something like that, if you compare it to, to a dairy facility. Um, and we linked the findings meaning whether they have cured or not, uh, that was one outcome. And the other outcome was, um, do we see a difference between the, of which, which scoring system is actually linked with lower carcass weight or lower average daily gain? So when, what they actually found in there was that, yes, consolidation depth really matters. The deeper the consolidation is, the more severe it gets. That matters. A second thing is that, yes, we don't work with lung lobes in our scanning system because we think it's very difficult to differentiate reliably in a farm condition which lung lobe is really affected. So we work with quadrants, meaning we have cranial quadrants, caudal quadrants, left and right, so four in total. And um, the cranial ones are everything that you see when the heart is visualized and in cranial of it, and the caudal ones are the, the parts that are caudal from the heart. And that was the second thing we evaluated. And the last thing was actually looking at the location, whether it mattered, whether it was the cranial right frontal or right cranial lobe or not, for example. The conclusion was that, yes, consolidation depth was a major factor. Yes, the more quadrants that were affected, the more severe the outcomes were, the lower the cure, the lower the carcass weight, etc. But for example, the location as per se did not really differentiate in different categories. So we then, we... Basically, we found an interaction between the depth of the consolidation and the number of quadrants. But then we ended up with 12 different categories in our scoring system, which is a lot. <laughs> it's, it's not practical. Yes. Yeah. Plus, right. the differences between several of these categories were not significant, even not on such a reasonably big data set. So we opted for the, the, the system for consolidation depth. Why? Because as soon as you have the highest consolidation depth in, in the system, you can stop your scanning. Even when you only saw the left side, you know that the animal is in this more severe category and there's no need to continue. And this may not seem like a big difference, but if you're scanning 400 calves or you have like a routine going on or technical staff, it does make a difference. So what we ended up with is a scoring system, which we named the QTO score following the technique score, uh, uh, score associated with that. And it's very recognizable because it has four categories. One is healthy. Those are animals which have reverberation artifacts or maybe some air bronchograms, comet tails. All of these are considered healthy in that system. And then we have mild pneumonia, moderate pneumonia, and severe pneumonia. Sounds familiar, no? Yeah, you know exactly. it from mastitis, yeah. you know it from endometritis. Yes. It's a proven system, yeah, that, that's it. But a mild pneumonia, we define it as a consolidation which is smaller than one centimeter. A moderate two to three centimeters, so between one and three centimeters, sorry. And the severe is more than three centimeters in depth. And yes, all of these categories can be linked with a different outcome and a different cure probability and also differences in average, uh, average daily gain. And you have mentioned a couple of times cure. Like how, how do you define cure uh, for those ends? Because I think that's very tra important for people listening to it. Uh, on how to use it. Yes, right? yes, it is. And it also was for us. Uh, uh, how do you define cure for a BRD case? Eh? If you look at literature, all these clinical definitions, we recently made a review together with some colleagues internationally. It's a mess, to be honest. Yeah. It's just yeah. a mess. It's so valuable. Um, so what we've done with this, these uh, ultrasound trials, we basically had a look in human medicine. And I'm not saying that there's an extensive body of evidence or, or that it, every doctor uses that, for example. But there are some papers that use lung re aeration as a cure criterion, meaning that a lung which is consolidated, inflamed, can actually become normal again and be fully re-aerated, filled with air again. And yes, we noticed in cattle that this is also occurring. 
So we can use it as a, as a cure criteria. So in some of the trials we've done, uh, we, we compare different antimicrobials and then try to determine not only differences in cure between them with the long reaeration cure criteria, but also in the length of the required therapy to achieve that long reaeration. It was very interesting studies because we noticed that for, uh, for um, that the average length of antimicrobial therapy required was only three to four days and not the seven days as this often often communicated. So that's one cure criterion, full reaeration. But it may be very strict. Um, so we also did some trials where we use, and also in the dairy herds that we are actually consulting in, uh, we often use regression below one centimeter. So meaning you go from the moderate, severe category, you go to mild. Eh? That, that would be the, the um, criterion for cure. And then we stop our antimicrobial treatment. But honestly, personally, I have mixed experiences with that. In some farms, like dairy farms, closed farms, it works reasonably well. They do not have relapse or aggravation of the lesions anymore. But in, in a recent trial we've done in a veal calf facility with high infectious pressure, mycoplasma bovis, etc., in my opinion, that <laughs> that was not That's not the different. way to go. I would have okay. uh, appreciated continuing the treatment until we have full reaeration. Wisenetics turns podcast airtime into brand authority. We don't sell ads; we elevate voices. If you're ready to boost your authority in the industry, scan the QR code on screen and speak with a brand authority specialist. Let's transform expertise into influence. Starting now. And like just we're coming up to the, the time limit here to make it short and sweet for everyone. But you mentioned like, and I like the, the event, how you explain like we start and we have like 12 different groups and we try to make it simple because simple, there's less deviations, easier for people to follow. So if you were to give like some advices on how do we find those calves in mild, uh, moderate, moderate or severe BRD, pneumonia, how, how do we treat them? Is it very different how we treat them? Well, is it very different? Um, yes, it is. For example, let me first report on the, on dairy calf day of, let me first report on the, on the veal calf data originally. In those studies, we found that animals in the mild category, 60% of them cured. In the moderate, it was 50%. And in the severe, only 33%. Okay. So yeah, it's very different. We, it's, it's different. It's different. Yeah. And if you, if you compare that system or these results with what we see on dairy farms, there we see that 60% of the mild cases cure by themselves without antimicrobials. We couldn't test that in the veal calf facilities because they received metaphylactic doxycycline, as I mentioned. But 60% of the mild cases self-cure. Um, for the moderate cases in dairy herd, so the, around to one centimeter, less than, um, less than three, 80 to 90% cure rate. It is achievable. If you don't reach that, your, your treatment, in my opinion, is suboptimal or this, there are other things wrong in the farm. And for the severe category, 30 to 40% of them cures with a reasonable length of antimicrobial therapy, meaning we have cured severe calves by dosing them for two, three months and they fully re -aerated. But that may not be economically, uh, politically and animal welfare wise uh, uh, be recommendation, of course, but it is, it is possible. And if what, how we work now in dairy farms is the mild cases observe. Okay, nice. Scan yeah, them next time again, 60% yeah. self cures. And if, they, yeah. and if they go to the moderate category, 80 to 90% of them will cure with an antimicrobial therapy, six days, that's, that's around the average length that is required to cure them. That's around the seven days we always communicate it. And for the severe category, 30 to 40% of them, um, and then the recommendation would be eight, eight to 10 days of antimicrobials if you want to give them a chance. So yes, for each category, it's different. And just as a, as a, uh, a take home, <laughs> last thing to, to make people, uh, people think, what is the role for uh, anti-inflammatory drugs in association with these different categories? Are we going to use them only in mild cases, severe cases? You can just think about all of the possibilities. So I really think this kind of QT scoring system is like simple enough, but stratifying, and it helps us moving away from population medicine, doing like good enough for 50%, doing too much for 50%, the rest. Yeah, exactly. We move towards precision medicine, tailoring treatment to the individuals and eventually using our resources way more efficient. Yeah, and using yeah using uh, 
your knowledge, right? Like, and what you, uh, the knowledge you're creating, and like you said, precision treatment. Like, it's it's we're all about, and we want to have more judicious use of antibiotics. So this is a it's a it's a great work. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. It was very interesting, and I'm sure this like really got people thinking. And I think what we need to do is like schedule another time to talk about this anti-inflammatory uh, <laughs> for those treatments. Yeah, that's great. It was great being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah, that's the end of uh, today's episode. This episode of uh, Black Belt, Dairy Health Black Belt by Wisenetics. Uh, again, I'm Luciano Cacheta. If you have any questions, send us uh, questions. We'll be in touch with all the, the guests that we have. Uh, we also would like to, if you like this, subscribe to the channel. That way you get like uh, updates from all the, the podcasts that are coming out. And I'll see you next time. Thank you.